to the uh, final PCC forum of the academic year. Um, it is my delight and true honor to be able to introduce Jacob Sherman tonight. And um, Jake is the kind of person that he's, he seems to be well versed in every subject that comes before him and always has something profound and meaningful to say, no matter if it's in philosophy, if it's in religion, if it's in the most recent movie that's come out. And um, I've heard several faculty say that they love to co-teach with him because they learn as much as the students do in doing that. Um, so to tell you a little about Jake's professional background, he's currently assistant professor and core faculty in uh, philosophy and religion at CIS. And he received his PhD in philosophical theology from the University of Cambridge. He received one master's degree in interdisciplinary studies at Regent College and a second master's degree in philosophy and religion at CIS. And I've heard by common consent that he's considered to be one of the most brilliant stars to come through the PCC program. So before joining CIS as a faculty member, Jake was previously a visiting lecturer in philosophy and religion at King's College London. And uh, with Jorge Ferrer, he is the editor of the participatory turn, Spirituality, Mysticism, Religious Studies. His writings have appeared in journals such as Religious Studies, Modern Theology, and the Haythrop Journal. And his next book is actually completed in the final stages before publication, Partakers in the Divine, Contemplation and the Practice of Philosophy. And he's currently working on his next book, which I believe is called Imagining Creation. Okay. So some of you may know that uh, when Jake was younger, he was a born magician and performed <laughs> under the name The Amazing Jacob with the rather brilliant tagline, no one knows a kid like a kid. So while we couldn't convince him to do any of his magic tricks for you tonight, I believe that the work that Jake does is a kind of magic. It's a kind of true magic. So that it's not smoke and mirrors, but it's the magic of awakening minds and conjuring and choreographing ideas so that you can watch these ideas in the classroom as they dance with this clarity and simplicity that he articulates. So, from boy magician to philosophical wizard, please help me welcome the amazing Jacob. <laughs> this works, I don't normally uh, use a PowerPoint when I do a presentation, but I thought if you're watching this on YouTube, as the people said they were going to, I thought it'd be totally boring if it was just my head. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea would be uh, that maybe it would be a little bit more there. And I also normally don't do much reading when I, certainly not when I'm in the classroom, but I couldn't figure out how to do this otherwise. So I may be reading uh, for a while today, but hopefully when we get into the discussion. Um, so contemplation, participation, and the practice of philosophy. The question I want to open up tonight is, what are the prospects for contemplative philosophy today? In recent decades, mystical or contemplative texts have assumed a place of surprising philosophical importance for discussions in both the analytic and the continental traditions. However, most of these studies fail to treat the practices within contemplative traditions as intricately bound to these traditions' theories, metaphysics, epistemologies, and philosophical theologies. This way of treating the question has largely served to shipwreck and inquiry from the outset. Because for the theories advanced within the contemplative tradition to find their intelligibility only within the practices of contemplative theoria. Contemplative insights don't precede contemplative practice, but they rather issue from and arise with the work of prayer, meditation, the cultivation of attention, various forms of relating to each other and to the world. Contemplative insights, uh, one might argue, well, let me put it this way. One might argue, moreover, that the divorce between contemplation and philosophy has led to cont contemplation being sentimentalized as a kind of pious ornament, or becoming a sort of like, merchant capital that people can then trade 
uh, while it's led to philosophy being banalized, to turn into something banal without connection to either the processing heavens above or the earth from which we come below, right? So, I want to argue uh, that in, this, in my time here this, today with you, I want to argue uh, that some of the great contemporary authors of the past inherited a different understanding of philosophy. Not one uh, that was confined to knowledge alone, but one that involved fundamentally a set of embodied traditions and practices of transformation that sought to open new emotional, volitional, and cognitive capacities. Moreover, I want to try to show how within the Western tradition at least, these newly cultivated capacities were allied to a particular kind of metaphysics, the metaphysics of participation, and that these new capacities themselves transformed the kind of philosophy, the theology, the kind of religion, the kind of contemplation that such contemplatives produced, thus binding practice and theory together in a kind of vital circle. Now, one apparent objection to all this might run like this. Whatever its historical validity might be, to talk of contemplation as an ally of philosophy is either willful or hopelessly anachronistic. Even if we reject normative secularity as the condition of possibility for philosophy's existence, that a lot of people still continue to think is the case, uh, even if we reject that, as much theology and religion has rightly done, we can hardly dispense with the procedural or formal norm of dispassionate and objective reason, at least as a communicative ideal. This is the objection. Put simply, as soon as you begin asking philosophers to pray or to meditate or to engage in some other such activity, many people will say, you stop doing philosophy, right? Just you're playing a different game. But is this really the case? The affinity, oh, actually, I'm going to show you that earlier. Uh, you can just see it. Uh, we'll skip on that one. Uh, I do want to look at this one for a second, uh, but maybe we'll come back to it. But is this really the case? If, we, if we're doing contemplation, if we're engaging in practices of meditation and prayer and so forth, have we really left philosophy? William Desmond writes, the affinity between priest and philosopher is an archaic one. The priest may be the older brother of the two, but both are originally of the same family. Modernity, as Weber, Hans Blumenberg, Jürgen Habermas, and others tell us, essentially constitutes itself on the suppression of this affinity. But I want to argue that philosophy itself in these postmodern times has already begun to move towards a recuperation of this very archaic relation. Philosophy is rediscovering its dignity as simultaneously theoretical and participatory, transformative, uh, and a self-implicating endeavor, which is also to say that philosophy is rediscovering itself as a way of life that seeks both to speak of and to realize the good, the true, and the beautiful, even the sacred, even the holy. So this talk has three sections. The first section, entitled Philosophical Mystics and Mad Scientists, I try to chart the trajectories of both the analytic and continental traditions over the last century. I show how their opposition is symptomatic of a larger divide afflicting philosophy itself, and that this opposition has both brought both traditions to the point of mutual exhaustion and insecurity. And I suggest that philosophy of religion might surprisingly help both schools to overcome their divide precisely by recovering a more original ideal of philosophy as a kind of spiritual practice. Theory and Theoria resting together, uh, theory and Theoria together restoring to philosophy and dignity too often far lost. Crucial to this recovery is the coincidence of transformative practice and philosophical insight. It's not just that philosophy ought to add a practical or spiritual component alongside its theoretical activities, but rather that the practices of transformation mediate and secure important aspects of philosophical discovery. The two go hand in hand. In the second section of this chapter, I consider more fully the possible contours of a turn to practice. I suggest that we ought to speak not just of a single turn to practice, but rather of many such turns, and I pose a critique of, what I, of these various turns to practice and what I call their liberal and their post-liberal variants. You can call that their modern and their postmodern variants, if that makes more sense to you. Before I commend, in the last section, what I call the metaxic turn to practice. So, the entire, uh, the entire talk is intended as something of an intervention and a plea for reclaiming something of philosophy's ancient dignity, 
something far more than a merely academic pursuit around which one might think, feel, speak, or write. Is it not the case that those of us who study philosophy, those of us who become philosophers, do so at all because we know that philosophy is worth so much more than just this? But this worth is revealed only when philosophy is engaged as a way and not merely as a subject. Philosophy is something that is only seen and understood insofar as it is also done. This is an ancient vision of what the discipline is, and it's a vision well worth recovering. The first part. Philosophical mystics and mad scientists, overcoming the analytic and continental divide. My argument in this first section is that the effort to reintegrate philosophy and spiritual practice is not some alien, extra-philosophical endeavor that therefore philosophers could just take or leave depending on what they want. Uh, but is in fact the kind of culmination of a number of the most important trajectories within the recent history of philosophy and philosophy of religion. Moreover, not only is this effort imminently rooted in what to a large extent is philosophy's own desire, but I contend that it also resolves a number of philosophy's most pressing problems, not least the methodological divide that opens a chasm in the heart of the discipline. In order to show this, I will first take a step back and consider the origins and nature of this divide between analytic and if you don't know anything about this, hopefully you will uh, within the next 10 minutes or so. Depending on when you mark its birth, we are nearing the centenary of this philosophical Cold War, and it might seem to stand as intractable as ever. Nevertheless, although the divide remains institutionally intense, I point to a number of substantive developments within both traditions that have already begun to obviate the divide itself. Moreover, I argue that despite its largely analytic origins, the continuing development of the discipline we call philosophy of religion, in particular, presses towards the recovery of a more traditional, of a more ancient model of philosophy that does not merely bridge, but in fact transcends the issues that most severely separate analytic philosophers from their continental colleagues. Indeed, although philosophy of religion once appeared to be a discipline almost, uh, I said that, at the heart of, uh, uh, in recent decades, the requirements of thinking, the, philo the phenomena of religious life, have provoked many philosophers of religion to challenge the perceived restrictions of analytic construals of rationality. If you know your analytic philosophy at all, you know oftentimes it's deeply cognoscentric. Uh, it's deeply wed into particular ideas about what counts as an argument and how rationality is to be, uh, to be perceived. And what I'm trying to point to is the way that diving in that direction, following that path all the way down while asking these questions about religions, has begun to open the discipline up from the inside, uh, so that the effort to be rigorous is actually undoing the efforts to police rigor uh, through a kind of through a kind of um, logical measure. At the heart of these new challenges is a discovery of the self-implicating nature of religious reasoning and a concomitant reassessment of the role of spiritual practices within philosophical thinking. So let's begin by considering the divide of what is perhaps its most wide, its widest and most acrimonious. Although a nascent divide existed between the equally revolutionary philosophies of Gottlob Frege and Edmund Husserl, it was in their successors that the divide ruptured into a chasm, especially in the tumultuous relations between the Vienna Circle and Martin Heidegger. The story goes as follows. <laughs> in the summer of 1929, that was a big In the summer of 1929, at 39 years of age, Heidegger delivered his inaugural lecture as professor of philosophy at the University of Freiburg in Breisgau. The lecture was entitled, What is Metaphysics? And in many ways, the lecture was a recapitulation and development of themes that are already present in Heidegger's giant work, Being with Time. Heidegger invited his audience to think about the nature of philosophy in an age in which the special sciences were in the ascendant. The sciences want to study beings and nothing else. But Heidegger wonders whether this nothing else might not be where the genuine considerations of metaphysics lie. He notes how difficult it is to ask the question of the nothing, how logic itself would rule this question out of bounds, for the logician believes that thinking must always be about something, and that the nothing is merely the negation of this always more primordial something. And yet here Heidegger demurs, for might it not rather be the case that the logical operation of negation itself depends upon some other prior nothing. As Heidegger says, 
The nothing is more original than the not in negation. If this thesis is right, then the possibility of negation as an act of the intellect, and thereby the intellect itself, are somehow dependent upon the nothing. Then how can intellect hope to decide about the nothing? The issue appears to be that before the intellectual disclosures of theory, logic, and science, we first encounter the world in pre-theoretical modes of disclosure. The affective and emotional comportment that Heidegger calls moods, before you ever start thinking about the world, you have moods about the world. More particularly, it is in the moods of angst that we become attentive not just to the world, but to the constitutive power of the nothing that grounds the more precise cognitive achievements of the intellect in the special sciences. So Heidegger says, only on the ground of the original revelation of the nothing can human existence approach and penetrate beings. It emerges as such existence in each case from the nothing already revealed. Dasein, which is Heidegger's word for, it's not exactly the human being, but it's the Heidegger's philosophy, which is in a certain sense us. Dasein means being held out into the nothing. Holding itself out into the nothing, Dasein is in each case already beyond beings as a whole. This being beyond beings we call, says Heidegger, transcendence. Now, Rudolf Carnap, if that name means anything to you, <laughs> logical, positive, philosopher extraordinaire, Rudolf Carnap was in the audience that day, <laughs> uh, and he would have none of it. Where Heidegger sought to subordinate the special sciences to a more primordial, philosophical, arguably metaphysical disclosure, Carnap joyously welcomed philosophy's absorption into the logic of science. Three years after Heidegger's inaugural lecture, Carnap published his essay, <coughs> The Elimination of Metaphysics Through the Logical Analysis of Language, in which he mercilessly Heide lampooned Heidegger's assertion that the nothing knots. Carnap's collaborator, A.J. Ayer, would later care, compare such statements to Alice's conversation with the White King. Mm -hmm. I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, the King remarked in a fretful tone, to be able to see nobody, and at such a distance, too. Why does as much as I can do to see real people by this light? The putative nonsense of a nothing that knocks was taken by the Anglo-American analytic tradition as a paradigmatic instance of a pseudo-statement, the meaningless use of language that continued to sustain the desolate <coughs> practices of metaphysics. Of course, Carnap understood that the world was inhabited by other types of meaning than the empirical and the scientific. But he held, maybe he legislated, depending on how you read it, that philosophy could not speak of these other types. Indeed, these other types of meaning could not be spoken about at all. They can only be expressed. Music and poetry had their place, but knowledge was not among their virtues. The error of the metaphysician, then, was to pretend to knowledge, when in fact he was doing something more akin to music. So Carnap says, metaphysicians are musicians without musical ability. Instead, they have a strong inclination to work within the medium of the theoretical to connect concepts and thoughts. Now instead of activating on the one hand this inclination in the domain of science and satisfying on the other hand the need for expression in art, the metaphysician confuses the two and produces a structure which achieves nothing for knowledge and something inadequate for the expression of attitude. So to call a philosophy meaningless is to do something more than to dispute its truth one can at least dialogue with those in error. But how does one converse with someone who's spouting nonsense? Interestingly, it wasn't only analytic philosophers who accused their continental counterparts of meaninglessness. The charge went the other direction as well. In 1951, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, George Ambrosino, Georges Bataille, and A.J. Ayer met in a Parisian bar. I wish I had a picture of it. <laughs> where despite shared interests, you can imagine. <laughs> where despite shared interests in the philosophy of perception, their disagreements proved insurmountable. So listen to this. Listen to Bataille throw the same charge back 
at the analytic philosophers, that the analytic philosophers will throw him at the continentals. He's going to say, what you're doing is meaningless. Here's Bataille. It so happened that I met A.J. Ayer last night. I thought about doing this with a French accent. And, it sounded <laughs> and, and our reciprocal interests kept us talking until about 3 in the morning. Marilyn Ponty and Ambrosino also took part. We finally fell to discussing the following very strange question. Ayer had uttered a simple phrase. There was a sun before man existed. And he saw no reason to doubt it. Marilyn Ponty, Ambrosino, and I disagreed with this proposition. And Ambrosino said that the sun had certainly not existed before the world. I, for my part, do not see how one can say so. The proposition is such as to indicate the total meaninglessness that can be taken on by a rational statement. I should say that yesterday's conversation produced the effect of a shock. There exists between French and English philosophers a sort of abyss which we do not find between French and German philosophers. So that's the time. Such accounts of mutual <coughs> comprehensibility could be easily multiplied and would include a whole set of encounters. Heidegger's encounter with Cassirer of Davos, Merleau-Ponty's meeting with Gilbert Ryle, the contest between John Searle and Jacques Derrida in the 80s over speech act theory, uh, or the attempt of Cambridge University to block Derrida receiving an honorary degree. And of course, there was the so-called hoax in the 1990s where someone punked of uh, the famous journal Social Theory by publishing a completely uh, inane article that used uh, a series of technical and jargon-filled postmodern words in the journal published it without checking out what it was about. It's supposed to be about quantum science and language. So despite the ubiquity and the acrimony of these direct encounters, there is reason to think that what Richard Rorty calls the tiresome analytic continental split is actually not nearly so wide as it may seem. Indeed, philosophers as different as the logician Grand Priest and the neo-pragmatist Rorty have noted striking parallelisms in their respective developments of the analytic and continental traditions. One way to understand this parallelism is to consider the conditions that gave rise to these two different tracks. As it turns out, both traditions arose in response to a very similar set of questions. In the closing decades of the 19th century, both Gottlob Frege and Edmund Husserl found themselves wrestling with the nature of mathematics, and subsequently with the nature of logic. And this led both of them to the persistent question of representation. How is meaning achieved, sustained, and understood in language and thought? How, how is meaning, in a sense, possible? for human beings and language users like us. In order to tackle this common problem, the two German-speaking philosophers developed rather different toolkits. Frege pioneered the tools of modern and formal logic and the philosophy thereof, while Husserl developed what's now called phenomenology. What we should note is that in their origins, these two traditions were not chiefly opposed to one another, but rather stood shoulder by shoulder in opposition to uh, two different stood shoulder by shoulder as two different means of opposing the earlier approaches of absolute idealism on the one hand, and what they called traditional philosophy on the other. As Carnap, Hahn, and Neuroth wrote in the 1929 Manifesto of the Vienna Circle, looking back, we now see clearly the essence of the new scientific worldview. This is their quote. Looking back, we now see clearly the essence of the new scientific worldview, colon, its opposition to traditional philosophy. And what was traditional philosophy? It was taken to be the philosophy that prevailed despite all of its tremendous diversity from the time of Plato until Kant. It, consi it consisted in the establishment of special philosophical assertions as opposed to the new philosophy which kept itself only to the logical clarification of scientific propositions. Traditional philosophy, in other words, was metaphysics. Husserl's break with traditional philosophy was perhaps less severe he thought that the transcendental phenomenology would fulfill what he called the secret longing of Western philosophy. But nevertheless, the break was there, and it was exacerbated by Heidegger and many subsequent thinkers within the broadly continental tradition. Both analysis and phenomenology then began their respective careers by breaking with what appeared to be the unsustainable project of traditional metaphysics. And once we recognize this initial affinity between the two traditions, the gestalt of their respective histories takes on a surprising form. Suddenly, the similarities seem remarkable and pronounced. The two traditions arose out of the same set of concerns, and their careers have continued to mirror each other. So as Graham Priest, a fantastic philosopher, 
who uh, I know that at least some of you have looked into for his work on negation. Uh, as Graham Priest writes, though they might come at answers from different directions, their problems have been much the same. At the core of both is the question of representation. How and in what way does language mind, language slash mind, represent the world? And within their tradition, certain philosophers play much the same role on each side of the divide. Frege and Husserl, the foundational figures, then Heidegger and Wittgenstein, who established the major problematics, as well as then turning against the very same major problematics. Kuhn and Foucault, who in their own turn historicized epistemology. Quine and Derrida, who took the positions to their ultimate points of collapse. These are not two different traditions, so much as parallel rail tracks going from and to the same places. Grand Priest paints a compelling pictures of two traditions now in their senescence. Not that either approach is presently on the brink of disappearing, but that both traditions seem to have run their creative courses. Both began the century in what Priest calls an optimistic phase, characterized by the belief that the new tools are either logical analysis or phenomenology would allow their adherents to solve at least a number of the most persistent philosophical problems. By the middle of the 20th century, optimism gave way to pessimism as the strains, cracks, and ruptures within the respective programs were subject to devastating critiques, both from within, later Heidegger and later Wittgenstein, and from without, Kuhn and Foucault. More recently, in the wake of these critiques, the traditions have become irreducibly fragmented by the loss of any consensual, consensual ground around which to build common philosophizing. This is perhaps most evident in the astonishing return of metaphysics. For it was the rejection of metaphysics that initially validated both the, the creation of both the analytic and continental approaches as something other than traditional philosophy. But this is hardly the case today. In the wake of Quine's naturalistic recuperation of ontology, Strawson's defense of defense descriptive metaphysics, and the revival of essentialism by a possible world semantics, much analytic philosophy has become overtly, unashamedly metaphysical. On the continental side, one can point to the work of Gilles Deleuze, who always considered himself a traditional uh, philosopher and metaphysician. Alan Badiou's set theoretical recuperation of Plato, the presence of Whitehead, and Isabel Stenders and Bruno Latour, Zizek's Hegelianism, or the speculative ontology of Quentin Minasu. These different instances each signal in their own way a return to the possibility of metaphysics along with the possibility, I would argue, of much else besides. But with this return, the unity and the raison d'etre of the two competing philosophical traditions is lost. And this is Priest's point. Both traditions have run their courses and find themselves now in a place of mutual fragmentation. Are there any substantive differences between the traditions? Many feel that there must be, but identifying the criteria for this differentiation is notoriously problematic. Following Critchley, I suggest that the most significant differences between analytic and continental approaches constitute around the broad cultural divide between the sciences and the humanities. In brief, Analytic philosophers have tended to emulate a scientific style, uh, to cultivate clarity, proximity, and objectivity, objectivity in their writings, to look to the modern sciences for the direction of the questions they should pursue, to accept the deliverances of the sciences as a given, and to seek objective results from increasingly specialized inquiries. On the continental side, on the other hand, rather than looking to the modern sciences, they tend to look to the modern arts and humanities to give them a they cultivate poetic and rhetorical styles, making full use of the metaphorical, uh, the playful, the elusive in their stock in their writings. They're organized around a common resistance to scientism, and they seek emancipatory results <coughs> from analytical and historical inquiries. On the one side, then, you have a kind of searching for knowledge. On the other hand, side, a kind of searching for critical transformation and expression. But the two don't meet. Philosophy of religion. Might philosophy of religion help to overcome this divide? At first glance, this seems to be an odd suggestion. In, the, in its early years, the renaissance of philosophy of religion that's happened in the last 60 years appeared to be a totally local phenomenon. Intense and vigorous within the Anglo-American analytic tradition, 
it went relatively unnoticed by philosophers hailing from the continental side of the divide. In such a situation, the renewal of philosophy of religion with the analytic school alone threatened only to widen the breach between the two traditions, rather than helping to overcome it. Well, let us complicate this picture. It's possible to tell the story of contemporary philosophy of religion in three chapters that unfold diachronically in roughly 20 or 30 year periods from the middle of the 20th century until the present. I argue that with the advent of each new phase, the substantive identification of philosophy of religion with analysis to core, uh, full stop, has weakened. The first chapter begins in the 1950s. Telling the story of the phoenix-like rise of their discipline has become something like a rite of passage for analytic philosophers of religion. And while other details may differ, nearly all of them agree on the moment of birth. It was a series of debates that culminated in the 1955 publication of Anthony Flew and Alistair McIntyre's New Essays in Philosophical Theology. Intriguingly, as that volume makes clear, the battle that led to the reopening of the possibility of philosophy of religion in an analytic context is not altogether dissimilar from the battle that went on between Heidegger on the one hand and Carnap and Neuroth and Ryle on the other. It's the same thing being played out over again. The issue was one of intelligibility, and the antagonists in both cases were representatives of the Vienna Circle. One of the co-editors, the atheist and positivist Anthony Flew, opened the volume with the charge that in the face of modernity, contemporary people of faith had so qualified their religious assertions that their religion had become merely a matter of picture preference. Right? They, they, they were epistemically so timid that what they were walking around with as their religion was a kind of feeling that at least they thought <coughs> Their religion was just a kind of picture preference. Uh, one of the contributors to the volume, R.M. Hare, seemed to confirm Flew's accusations when he rooted religious belief in what he called the made-up word, he called it a blick, B-L-I-K, which he defined as a sort of attitude or perspective on the world that is not based upon reasons at all, but still shapes our feelings and responses to events of the world. For Hare, religious belief was avowedly not a hypothesis but was rather understood as something that came to a fundamental attitude. Your religious blick is the attitude you carry around with you in the world. Some people have a capitalist blick, some people get a, you know, some people have a kind of Buddhist blick, some people have, uh, you know, get a particular wishiness when they listen to the Grateful Dead, right? It's just all a kind of religious blick with no justification. So clearly the specter of logical positivism was in the air. But it was Flew who perhaps unwittingly helped exercise that spirit when he pointed to the weakness of Hare's approach. If, if for Hare religion is reduced to a blip, then asked Flew, how is Hare in any sense a religious person? How can he call himself really a religious person if he's just saying, it's, it's kind of an attitude I have? Basil Mitchell, by contrast, an Oxford theologian who was in the volume as well, provided a more robust defense of faith when he argued that the existence of evil didn't count against one's belief in the existence of God, the validity of, validity of which he rooted in a commitment formed upon the basis of an encounter, right? something that happened in life. Flew was totally unconvinced. Right? Flew thought Basil Mitchell's argument was kind of complete crap. Uh, and he accused Mitchell of improperly weighing the evidence. The problem of evil, said Flew, overruled whatever evidence there was for God's reported existence or encounter. But, and here's the point, as uh, one philosopher comments, what should not be overlooked in this response is that in giving it, Flew has fundamentally shifted the terms of the debate, and he's shifted them now in a very traditional direction. No longer is it being said that theological or religious assertions are meaningless because unfalsifiable. Rather, suddenly, the claim that is in light of the evidence, they must be judged false. So my point in telling you this whole story is this. At the very birth of analytic philosophy of religion, philosophers of religion, because of the thing they were encountering, were already overcoming the analytic constitution of philosophy by resuming philosophy in a more traditional mode. Right? They were moving beyond the sense that what we're just dealing with our language names that could be meaningless, and suddenly found themselves forced because of the ultimacy of the issues at, at, at matter, uh, forced into something like the way philosophy used to be done. Now to be sure, in the years that followed, Anglo-American philosophy and religion remained culturally bound to the analytic tradition, and it garnered most of its success through a careful negotiation of the possibilities within philosophical 
analysis, and I spent a lot of time doing modal logic and probability theory and philosophy of language and other things like that, especially through the 70s. By the late 70s and 80s, however, a new chapter opened. Suddenly, philosophers of religion began to explore more specific doctrines, practices, and issues arising from within religious communities themselves, rather than merely responding to an agenda set by the critics within the academy. At the same time, philosophers of religion began to look carefully at their classical predecessors in the medieval and early modern period for insight and inspiration. This emboldened phase can thus be considered not only as the continuing resurgence of philosophy of religion, but as a genuine return to the kind of philosophical theology or philosophical religion that had been practiced in previous ages. <coughs> Nevertheless, the retrieval was incomplete. If you pick up text from this period, you'll be notice. Philosophy of religion retained an almost exclusively propositional character, arguably as a result of it being beholden to an overly intellectualist account of anthropology, what Genevieve Lloyd calls the man of reason who stomps through the history of philosophy as if he has a kind of objective Cartesian picture of everything that can be expressed in propositions that might either be true or false. And as a result, it remained ill-equipped to deal with thicker, more robust dimensions of religious life such as the diachronic transformation of lives immersed in contemplative practice, religious communities, uh, and ritual celebrations. Philosophy with a capital P. We can, however, already begin to discern a third, still nascent phase in the career of modern philosophy of religion. Over the last two decades, a diverse set of prominent philosophers have begun to radicalize the concern with religious epistemology in order to argue that one's affective, intentional, and attitudinal dispositions might alter his or her ability to discern what nevertheless remain real religious or spiritual truths. So I could give a whole set of people who do this, but we'll skip by them. All of these, all of these people, though, who I can tell you about, uh, <laughs> largely identify themselves with the analytic traditions, but their explorations take them decisively beyond analysis. What lies beyond analysis, however, is not phenomenology, or some other iteration of continental philosophy, but rather a robust recovery of philosophy in its more ancient mode, a traditional approach to philosophy that was already arguably forgotten before the 19th century ever began. Neither an armchair exercise nor the handmaiden of the laboratory, philosophy in its classical guise was, as Pierre Hadot reminds us, a way of life. Certainly it discovered and propounded what it took to be truths, but this propositional aspect was inextricably tied to the integral transformation of the philosopher's entire being in his or her noetic, affective, corporeal, and communal dimensions. For the moment, let us call this classical model philosophy with a capital P. By recovering philosophy with a capital P, philosophy of religion begins not so much to bridge the analytic continental divide as to obviate to transcend it entirely. Suddenly you don't have people seeking knowledge on the one hand and transformation on the other. Knowledge and transformation are co-arising in this more traditional mode of practice. In recent years, the recovery of philosophy with a capital P has become something of a groundswell. It might even be appropriate to call it a paradigm shift, albeit one that remains diffuse and hitherto unnamed. This development is especially pronounced in the recent work of the eminent analytic philosopher and epistemologist Paul Moser, in his book, The Elusive God, Moser calls for a radical revision of what he calls religious epistemology, based upon a new analysis of the role of volitional transformation in the reception of, quote, purposively available authoritative evidence. It may not be your favorite way of talking, I'll try to follow it for a second. What kind of evidence, Moser asks, should philosophers expect from the divine? Until recently, philosophy of religion seems to have either repudiated the search for evidence at all, or it has demanded a kind of spectator evidence upon which all supposedly rational parties would be able to agree. Bertrand Russell, for example, falls into the latter category. When asked what he would say to the deity if he were to meet God after his death, Russell replied, not enough evidence, not enough <laughs> evidence. <laughs> but Moser is unconvinced, not enough evidence for what? In my own words, Moser's point is this, to apply the same hegemonic standards of rationality to all areas of inquiry, regardless of diverse subject matters and different objects of belief, 
is to cripple inquiry from the outset. Far from securing epistemic justification, such a monolithic approach to rationality is itself unjustified and fails to attend to the way that particular modes of rationality have to be suited to particular modes of inquiry. Moser is especially focused on the role of desire or volition in the knowledge of the divine. We need an account, he argues, of the conformal reception of divine evidence that recognizes the way in which human beings must become attuned in their wills and their hearts as much as in their beliefs if they are to receive the evidence offered. Indeed, for Moser, this confirmation of the heart and mind to a divine reality is itself the most significant form of its evidence. <coughs> Problems raised by the philosophy of religion have been the motor for a recuperation of the self-implicating and transformative but still realist approach to philosophy. And the recovery of this realist philosophy moves one beyond the exclusive either or of the analytic and continental approaches. I've focused so far on those hailing from within the analytic tradition, but this philosophy of religion prompted retrieval of philosophy with a capital P is happening on the other side of the disciplinary divide just as much. Moser's work, for example, could be fruitfully compared to certain aspects of the more continentally inclined, what some, pe some people call him post-analytic, Charles Taylor. Towards the end of the secular age, while discussing the underdetermination of contemporary disbelief by precisely the scientific evidence that skeptics claim compels their disbelief, Taylor draws what he calls the Desdemona analogy. What makes Othello a tragedy, and not just a tale of misfortune, is that the whole <coughs> protagonist capable in his too ready belief in the evidence fabricated by Iago. He had an alternative mode of access to Desdemona. You know, the story, Desdemona. Uh, Iago has basically led Othello to think that Desdemona is being unfaithful, but of course she's been pure of heart the entire time, and she's protested over and over again to Othello, and Othello won't believe her. So Taylor's point is that what makes it a tragedy is not just that he doesn't believe her, but that he's culpable in not believing her. He had an alternative mode of access to her innocence in Desdemona herself if he could only have opened his heart or his mind to her love and devotion. As regards our belief in the sacred, as regards our belief in God, as regards our belief in divinity and enchantment or the lack thereof, we are, claims Taylor, in a place quite similar to that of Othello. Our disbelief is rooted in our exclusive attention to what Taylor calls external sources and what Moser refers to as spectator evidence. But it is precisely our disbelief that underwrites our decision to attend only to these external and spectator forms of evidence. As Taylor writes, once you accept unbelief, then you will probably also accept the ideology which accords primacy to external sources, which deprecates the internal ones as incompetent here, following our own modern code of honor, that of the adult, rational subject of knowledge. And here you should hear echoes of Genevieve Lloyd's critique of the male philosophy, philosophical subject again. In order to see the evidences of faith, one must be willing to leave behind the fiction of a generic adult rationality that judges all things by the accumulation of more and more spectatorial evidence. Both Moser and Taylor bridge the gap between theory and practice, knowledge and critical transformation that has haunted the analytic and continental divide. The philosopher no longer considers matters in the safety of a thought experiment behind a wall of inference, but rather risks him or herself and his or her noetic enclosure in the thrall of inquiry. In this manner, one escapes analytic strictures not by taking one's cues, for example, from Derrida rather than from Searle, but rather by recovering a robust relationship between philosophy and spiritual practice, precisely the sort of relationship that characterized philosophy in its most robust historical modes. So just now I mentioned thought experiments. One of the hallmarks of analytic philosophy has been its frequent recourse to thought experiments, and perhaps the most overworked character of analytic thought experiments is the mad scientist, lurking everywhere, always eager to get your brain into a fact. <laughs> experimenting always upon others for the sake of his dissociated knowledge quest. He represents in many ways the acme of the division between knowledge and critical transformation. 
but perhaps we can picture the recovery of philosophy with a capital P as its own kind of mad science, a mad science with a twist. It is now the philosopher who has become a, like a mad scientist, scientist. But rather than strapping patience to a gurney within his own head, the philosopher must rather experiment on himself, risking his or her time, attention, desire, status, and rationality within the cauldron of religious and spiritual transformation. I'm not sure what to call these philosophers. Are they mad scientists, philosophical mystics, or just philosophers in the truest sense? Whatever these new philosophers of religion are, they seem to be beyond the pale of either analytic or continental traditions. It is thus that philosophy of religion overcomes the analytic and continental divide by showing that the divide was only ever an ethical phenomenon in the first place, a hiatus, on the other side of which a wider, more ancient, more classical philosophy still remains. So that was the first and very long section. The second two are very quick. The turn to practice, liberal and post-liberal, or modern and post-modern versions. So the first one, the liberal or the modern term. Religious studies, theology, and philosophy have, of course, witnessed a broad turn to practice. Those of you who have been in these fields hear this language a lot uh, in recent decades. But the particular turn to practice that I'm interested in, the one that I see Taylor, Moser, and others making, is not at all to be read along the absolute constructivist, non-realist, or correlationist lines that have often dominated recent accounts. Far more interesting than these largely 20th century projects is an account of self-implicating practices and noetic transformations as so many means for skillfully negotiating the subtle accessibility conditions operative throughout the world. This is philosophy with a capital P, a philosophy still captured by the grandeur of reason, and it is the sort of philosophy that we need both to recover and to develop if we are to make contemporary sense of contemplative traditions and their claims to knowledge. The world is not laid out as if placed on a grid, fully disclosed for all to see with the pseudo-objectivity of the spectator's gaze. Rather, the physiognomy of the world changes according to our mode of knowing, which is to say that new faces, aspects, dynamisms, and resonances are elicited when the world is approached appropriately. It was Husserl who rightly taught us to regard the things of the world not as singular and simple, but as existent only through the constitutive multiplicity of the different aspects that they disclose endlessly and progressively as we relate to them. You can't see every part of this at one point, even though it's, even though it's transparent. I still can't see the whole of it. I only see it by constantly turning it around, shifting it. There's an endless series of a kind of infinite series of aspects in anything that's real. That's exactly what makes it real, right? Anything that's fabricated can be fully known. Anything that's real always has that stubborn kernel that opens ever more infinitely. Now, too much of the contemporary turn to practice, however, has remained mired not in realism, but in a sort of residual transcendentalism that tends to press the discussion in non-realistic directions. And because of this, I think it, it might be helpful just to spend a couple minutes uh, thinking about what these, what I want to call kind of aborted turn, turns to practice might entail. So why might an emphasis upon practice in the philosophy of religion lead us away from realism? The culprit, as Paul McDonald Jr. has recently argued, is a reification of the self-world divide which in philosophy of religion is subsequently doubled to include the self-world and then also the self-God, or you can say the self-spirit, self-divine uh, self divide. So you can trace a familiar trajectory from Descartes to Hume to Kant, but the emphasis is placed in each instance upon the consolidation of the subject as inviolably bounded, or to borrow Charles Taylor's apt description, buffered, a self that surveys the world from a distance and sees itself as invulnerable, as the master of the meanings of things for it. According to the standard reception of Kant, reason knows only that which it is able to experience, 
and it is only able to experience that which it also produces by a schematization on the one hand and the possession of categories and concepts on the other. Don't worry if you don't get all the vocab. The point is, is that reason only knows that which it pulls out of itself. We can only experience that which we are like. There's a certain sense in which I think that's true. But the achievement of the modern buffered self lies precisely in the suppression of the resonances between the subject and the world which it inhabits. For only in this way can absolute freedom, which is what the early modern philosophers were so often after, only in this way can absolute freedom be preserved. If then we are to both preserve both freedom and the undeniable fact that we do seem to experience a world, we can only do so by first reducing what is experienced to what the self autonomously filters, orders, constructs, and constellates. The end result, we only ever experience what we construct. And the cost of all of this is high. We never in fact know the world in itself at all. To be sure, Kant seeks to avoid the non-realist bent of his conclusion by transcendentalizing subjectivity, and so arguing that the way the world appears for us is not variable, but is rather the way the world necessarily appears to all human cognition, maybe to all cognizers and thinkers themselves. But this attempt on his part to save some sort of commonality hasn't fared well. For instance, Kant's treatment of regulative and constitutive ideals has proven wholly questionable, and there are very few today who defend the rational necessity of Kant's 12 categories, which are just simply important to his system. This is why Kant's influence in contemporary debates regarding the recuperation of practice within philosophical reasoning has almost always resulted in some form of either metaphysical or epistemic non-realism. The Kantian critical emphasis upon the subject's role in the construction of reality is maintained, while, on the other hand, the universality of the subject's deliverances is jettisoned. It is still the case that our knowledge is bounded. We only ever know a world that we construct, but the worlds we construct are now indexed to a variety of inherited linguistic and cultural variables. Variables made effective through performative, but often incommensurate practices. Where before, the buffered Kantian self could only know the world insofar as it constructed the world according to the exigencies of reason and the understanding. Now it is still the case that the buffered postmodern self can only know the world insofar as it constructs the world. But this very process of construction is now subject to the transiency, accident, and flux of our historicized being. The genuine differences between Kantian apodicticity and postmodern irony shouldn't lead you astray. They both, in both cases, the knowing subject remains decisively bound in a cage of its own making. And a semantic cage can keep you bound just as fully as an epistemic. The double reification of the boundary. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, well, no, let's do this one. The double reification of the boundary is especially evident when we turn to theological or religious questions. Already in Kant, he liked to talk about the symbol of God, but the symbol, you can hear it, it's a symbol of God. The symbol of God was more or less evacuated of any real content entering the critiques only as a man's of, means of shoring up certain theoretical desiderata, right? Kant trucked God in in order to shore up certain things that his system couldn't get otherwise. It's the great modern move. Descartes does the same thing in the meditations. As MacDonald summarizes Kant's position, if knowledge only extends to the world we experience and God is not an object in the world we experience, the knowledge of God, properly speaking, is impossible. We nevertheless can think of God or the transcendent even though what we think about, even though what we think about God, particularly through symbolic or analogical predication, bears no specifiable or epistemically relevant relation to who or what God may be like in reality. In other words, we still try to think God, we still try to think the sacred, but we do so knowing that it might have nothing to do with God, the sacred, the world, us, or anything else. Once a strong cognitive boundary is erected between the divine reality and the human knower, then there are only two possible options for God talk. Either we draw God within our imminent cognitive boundaries, making God wholly subject to whatever forms of determination also subject human minds, 
or we place God entirely outside of the boundary, rendering God utterly inaccessible, wholly other, the two options are not mutually exclusive, and much 20th century theological reflection has involved a shuttle between these two strategies. God as either the imminent symbol of our highest ideals, or God as the holy other, leaving us finally in the midst of a dizzying religious paradox with no apparent <coughs> Many, many proposals within the contemporary turn to practice seek to diffuse this apparatic shuttle by declaring at the outset that religious language, contemplative language, spiritual language is not in the business of fact stating. On this account, one need hardly worry about our inability to identify the sacred or our penchant for constructing gods of our own making. This is simply how religious language works. For example, throughout his many writings, Don Cupid, who was the, uh, the dean of the former college, <coughs> Don Cupid argues that the meaning of the word God is to be found simply in the way it orients speech and life. Quote, God as a regulative ideal or a moral postulate. This is why Cupid came, claims we become like gods. Mm -hmm. To believe is simply to commit ourselves to creating a world in accord with the God we claim to worship. As Cupid writes, in religion, Myths supply the world, and myths supply archetypal patterns that are intended to be reenacted in the lives of believers. You're supposed to play God, for God's sake, says Cupid. <laughs> for Cupid, the real meaning of religious dogma is not found in any sort of metaphysical or cosmological claim. Dogma must be translated into spirituality, but spirituality is then translated into a series of practices or expressions of feeling. Cupid's approach is extreme, but in this way it reveals with particular clarity the operative logic within what we can call the classical liberal turn to practice. For the classical liberal or modern turn to practice, orthodoxy merely serves the truth, or orthodoxy merely serves the real truth of religion, which is orthopraxy, right? The whole point of everything you believe is to get you to act in a certain way. But the way you act isn't subject to anything. Those actions can be determined just like in our hair as a kind of blick. Some people want to act in accord with the capitalist sacred, right? And there's a kind of free saw to, uh, to bind that people can get and feel a sort of relief through that. Some people want to act in accord with a more Advaita Vedanta way. Some people are drawn to certain fundamentalist expressions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, most classical liberals tend to assume that orthopraxy can be non-problematically invoked according to some sort of procedural account of justice. But Cupid is more honest than this. And he calls what he, he calls what he advocates a kind of nihilism. If there is finally no grain to the universe, no real, or what largely amounts to the same thing, no cognitive access to the real, for what could it mean to say that although there is a real, we can know nothing of its being or its effects? Then orthopraxies, various forms of practice, are nothing more than the assertion of our own individual or communal constructions. And so it would seem that according to the logic of the classical modern or liberal turn to practice, voluntarism, the expression of your will, becomes the real secret of what religion is about. Now there's a second form, a kind of postmodern form of a turn to practice that calls itself the post-liberal turn to practice. And this involves, I won't walk you through the entirety of George Lindbeck's approach to this, uh, but this involves a recognition that practices, Lindbeck wants to recuperate a way of saying the world might really be in accord with who we are by saying that our, our truth statements, when I speak, my grammatical cultural approach to speaking the truth is determined by whether what I say accords with how my community acts. So the point, the point of this sort of postmodern or post-liberal approach would be to say if Cupid and those like Cupid say finally we just get to say whatever we want, we express our own desire in the world and try to construct a world accord with that to make ourselves gods accord with our own desire for the remaking of the world. The post-liberal approach says I'm part of a community in the first place. And truth, for me, is vouchsafed by what my community is capable of saying. 
It's a version of what Rorty says, when Rorty says truth is what your peers let you get away with. Except for Rorty, your peers are democracy, right? For Rorty, your peers are the American democratic educated polis within which we now dwell. For these religious studies and theologi theological scholars adopting the postmodern, postliberal approach, your peers are your community and practice. But in either way, you're still not diagonalizing outside of your language. You're not getting outside of uh, the circle, the buffered self, in various forms that it might take, right? And one way to think about it is that the buffered self has grown increasingly diffuse. The self starts out buffering itself with a kind of Cartesian or Kantian armor, right? And then it thinks everybody comes with the same shell in the world. Then it starts saying, no, the self is buffered with my own particular language use. And then, you know, so it's all English users or whatever have this kind of uh, grammatical, cultural, linguistic buffer to it. But then you widen it even further and say, well, it's how language is used by my community. Something's intervening, but you're still not getting outside of the way a group of us happen to interact with each other. So, if this is the case, uh, if if we're trying, if what we're trying to do is to get past this buffered self, one of the ways we can do this is to begin to begin to bring critiques of any possibility of producing that kind of division between world and never. Right. So one of the ways that I and Jorge and some others have tried to do this is by bringing critiques along the lines of Davidson's critique of the scheme content division. So Donald Davidson argued that all of these forms of buffering the self are basically forms that rely upon the coherence of the concept of a schema that somehow I have in myself that's different from the world, right? And you see what basically every one of these forms is doing is they're, they're finding a way to take the human, knower, somehow out of the world which it would otherwise be immersed in, right? So Davidson's argument is that every scheme is already itself part of the world. And if every scheme is already itself part of the world, then I don't have any protection from the world because my schemes are themselves ways in which the world is coming into me, right? And if you, it, once you start to dissolve that circle around the self, you move from a buffered self back to what maybe the self never actually stopped being in the first place, a porous self, which is a self in the midst of a world that's interacting with it and exerting influences upon it. If this is the case, then we're thrust back into a much simpler theory of truth, one devoid of epistemic intermediaries between our beliefs and the objects of our beliefs. Once we abolish the scheme content dualism, Davidson says, we reestablish unmediated touch with the familiar objects whose antics make our sentences either true or false. This is not a return to naive realism or to some sort of positivism. For along with ridding ourselves of the notion of conceptual frameworks, we also relinquish the now redundant concept of uninterpreted reality, the sort of reality presumed by the reductionism of a spectatorial gaze. Instead, we find ourselves confronted with a world that not only invites, but even demands speculative and metaphysical supplement. A world that is already, as a world, generating theory. Not, however, theory for theory's sake, but theory as theoria, contemplation, radically permeable to the world below and to the gods above, suspended dynamically between the embers of the stars. And so this last section, a few pages, the toxic practices. This is where we get to some of what I'd like to try to open up uh, as I engage with this material. What I've somewhat clumsily called the liberal and the post-liberal, or the modern and the postmodern turns to practice, fail all of them because they absolutize certain epistemic boundaries. This epistemological insistence upon finitude is always a problem because, as one of my great heroes, Nicholas de Cousineau, in order to name and to cognize the limits of the finite, one must have already transgressed and served the finite. And so despite their claims to the contrary, neither the liberal nor the post-liberal terms in fact avoid metaphysics at all. Indeed, 
both may be rather seen as enforcing an alternative metaphysics of essential subjective finitude. A metaphysics that is all the more dogmatically and vehemently policed because it remains essentially covert. This double reification of the self-world and the self-divine divide leaves the self, whether the transcendental ego or the sociolinguistic subject, simultaneously isolated and absolutized. In the absence of access to what lies above, the transrational, the transpersonal, in the absence of access to what lies below, the pre-theoretical and the pre-linguistic, both the liberal and the post-liberal turns to practice at end regard the anthropic middle as self-referring and self-mediating, a conclusion that the German idealists were maybe the first to draw. But when the middle is taken as absolute and self-mediating, it not only subjects us to aporia, problematics, but also tends to evacuate itself. As self-mediating, the middle exists only as a vanishing mediator. It disappears. Logically, even grammatically, the middle can only exist by virtue of its tensive relationship to both its predecessors and its successors. This is why within classical philosophy, especially under the influence of Plato, the middle, the medixi, was taken to be chiefly the realm of participation, the thexis. And it is this participatory middle that I want to commend as a way of recuperating the role of spiritual practice within philosophical knowing. This is not a new idea or a passing philosophical fad, but is the way that philosophy first constituted itself in the persons of Socrates and Plato and the traditions that they began. Indeed, it may be that by living into this participatory middle, philosophy with a capital P reconstitutes itself even today. But what is the middle? In the midst of a variety of discourses on the nature of eros that make up Plato's text, the symposium, Plato introduces the symbol of the middle when he has Socrates choose not to craft a speech of his own about Eros, but instead to recount a conversation he once enjoyed with the priestess Diotima. For Diotima, the middle is the realm of both human beings and diamonds, demons, diamonds, as it is likewise the realm of the commerce they sustain between heavens, heaven, transcendence, and earth, immanence. Earlier in the dialogue, Socrates had already argued that Eros ought to be thought of as fundamentally 